Well, it's a business pretty much as usual back in most of the footballing nations around the world, having uh, taken a break for the best part of a month at least because of the World Cup. But that's over and quickly forgotten. It's back to business in the Liverpool and Man City about to do business, I think, tomorrow or Friday, our time. And uh, already the resumption of the Premiership is underway. With me now is our man from the UK, Andy Butler, to uh, talk about uh, football with a domestic kind of twist to it today. But I suppose we should start with a couple of things from the World Cup. We haven't spoken to you for probably about a week. Um, How did that final play out in the UK? Is it generally considered, as a lot of scribes are saying, in the opinion of, say, someone like yourself, the best World Cup final that you've seen? I think that's fair comment. Yeah, um, it's. I'm quite cynical, really. I'm quite. Uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a tough uh, person to convince because uh, I, I do look back and think of previous World Cups. The first World Cup I saw, the first game of football I ever watched was the 1966 Cup final. Um, shows my age, but um, and I thought the 1970 final, the Brazil team was a great final. There some other uh, Italy winning it as well. I think it was in '82 good final but I think this probably will go down as the greatest final it was meandering along for 80 minutes with um, Argentina two up and then suddenly France exploded Uh, and just the nature of extra time which can be a fairly sterile affair sometimes those added 30 minutes Uh, but that provided a lot of thrills and spills even in the closing seconds and then the penalty shootout and of course the narrative was Messi um, winning the World Cup at last. Mm. Uh, so I, I just think the whole uh, storyline, really, and, and the climax to it, um, it, it will go down as the greatest in my memory anyway. Forgive me for indulging a little bit of cynicism here. I have great difficulty coming to terms with trying to reconcile this connection between being the greatest player of all time and having to win the World Cup. Well, he, a player, a single player can't win the World Cup, and uh, Messi didn't win the World Cup for Argentina. He was an integral part of a unit that helped um, Argentina win the World Cup. But whether they won it or lost it or didn't it make the final, why should that, in fact determine the greatness or the level of greatness of, in this case, Messi or any player for that matter. Yeah, fair comment. And uh, people were making that point in England before the game kicked off that uh, win or lose, really, Messi's place within the all-time greats was secure. Um, Whether he is the best in history is open to debate. It's one of those uh, arguments that will rage for for decades, really, for, for generations. Um, some say he is. Um, I think he's put Ronaldo in the shade, certainly. Uh, but I, I take your point. I don't think you need to be the best uh, or to have won a World Cup to be considered to be the best. I mean, I, I tend to think that Pele, in my view, it's all open to debate. Pele is the best player in the world, in my view. Mm. Uh, I don't put Maradona quite in that category, I'll be honest with you. Um, I'm a little biased because I'm a Mancunian. Although I'm a Man City fan, I thought that George Best would be in my top uh, few. I was lucky enough to see George Best. I even bought him a drink, would you believe? And they interviewed <laughs> him a few just times. Just one? Uh, just one drink? <laughs> yeah, it, it, was a, it was a white wine. Paddy oh, Carrera, okay. who played with him in the same midfield for Man United in the 1968 European Cup final, uh, was working with me, introduced me to George at Old Trafford, and uh, it was in the early 90s. And uh, I asked George if he'd like a drink. He had a white wine and he just necked it, completely necked it in seconds. <laughs> um, I wasn't going to buy him another after that. But um, uh, uh, so, but but that aside, George Best for me was um, the best player I've... I saw Maradona play for Barcelona against Man United as well in the early 80s. Um, and Maradona, I, I don't know, I just have a sort of... There's something about Maradona I don't quite put him on that pedestal that others do I think Messi is right in the equation he's in the conversation certainly mm. but I think Pe- I think it'd be Pele Messi somewhere in there Maradona Yo- um, uh, Johan Cruyff as well of course was uh, uh, a, a brilliant player but I think it comes down to kind of generations doesn't it and whatever generation you happen to fall into you kind of you're a bit biased towards them which is fair enough it's understandable and we'll have to just sit back and watch for the next few years, probably for the, at least four, maybe eight years, see how far up that ladder of uh, greatness Mbappe goes. I mean, uh, you, you've obviously seen a lot more football and studied it closer than I have. At his peak, was Messi as quick around the field as Mbappe is now? 
I don't think so. I don't think he'd got that electrifying pace, really, uh, Messi. Um, but he could dribble, which was George Best's strength, really. Mm. He could dribble and he was strong. He is strong. If you think of the physical nature of football, uh, then and now, uh, that ability just to shrug off challenges uh, is something really you don't uh, perhaps appreciate as much because you do marvel at the the kind of flair, the ball playing skills which Messi has got. But yeah, I mean Mbappe's got that electric pace, um, and he, he, you know what he's achieved: hat trick in his World Cup, uh, second World Cup on Sunday, fantastic on the losing side, albeit. Um, so we'll have to see how he. Uh, measures up over the fullness of time. But although he's done it on the world stage, I don't think Mbappe's done it at club level uh, to the extent yeah, that other curious. people mm. have. Yeah, it's usually the uh, I mean, Me- Messi's only played in Spain and he played in, he's moved to France, albeit at the end of his career. Um, Ronaldo's played in more leagues in Europe, admittedly. You know, Messi's never played in Argentina. And when I was watching the pictures a couple of hours ago of the Argentinian parade, which turned into a helicopter parade in the end, didn't it? I think for yes. safety reasons, <laughs> uh, they had to abandon it. Um, you know, Messi's never played over there. So was that, was that kind of, he's not always been the uh, the kind of idol. Uh, he fell out with them for a while. Yeah, um, it's peculiar, it's, isn't it, uh, when you think about it? Yeah, it's, um, yeah I, I exactly. Could, I couldn't imagine, for example, um, an all-black rugby idol in this country who's and never played any rugby in New Zealand. Exactly, um, exactly. But, but anyway, it's difficult. Um, but yeah, so in the meantime, as I mentioned, it's business back as usual, or nearly back business as normal, I think, in the Premiership. What's the situation here? Are all of the members of the England team uh, given a certain period to kind of uh, recover from the World Cup, or is that very much up to the discretion of the owners of the clubs? It's up to the discretion of the owners of the clubs. Um, 48 hours from now, I'll be at the Etihad watching Manchester City against Liverpool. Um, looking forward to that, chomping at the bit, as are many football fans up and down the country in England uh, who've been starved of live football and televised club football over the last uh, four or five weeks. Um, but yeah, it, it, it all depends. And there's a lot of controversy about it, to be honest with you, because um, Jack Grealish has been uh, in New York the last few days. He's been on a Home Alone tour, uh, quite jealous, actually, quite fancied doing that. And he's been pictured around various... Uh, spots around New York enjoying himself. Now, people are saying, well, hang on a minute, he's hardly played any football for England. He only came on a substitute a couple of times. Can't he get back and play? However, I don't really subscribe to that theory. I think uh, and uh, Liverpool, Manchester City, very good at managing their resources. I think they probably turned around and said, look, you take a break. It's the only break you're going to get, really, between now and next May. I mean, the Champions League final is it, uh, in June. So it could be a long six months. It could be a very, very, well, it be a quick six months because it, it'll shoot by because you're going to be playing matches every three or four days. Mm. Manchester City's uh, schedule is Liverpool on uh, Thursday night, your Friday morning, um, and then Liverpool play again before City play at Leeds next Wednesday. They've got Everton on New Year's Eve. Then they play Chelsea twice, once in the FA Cup, uh, once in the league as well. They've got Manchester Derby. So the games come come thick and fast before the Champions League resumes in February. So I, I think it's quite sensible just to say, look, have a breather, uh, get it out of your system, uh, and then come back to this uh, cold English winter or wet English winter as it is at the moment, and we're going to need you. So I think it's just it's quite a good strategic move, really. Others will play. De Bruyne played against Girona on Saturday. City played a, a warm-up game against the Spanish side um, at their academy stadium, which holds about 7,000. And uh, De Bruyne and Gundogan played. So they'll play it against Liverpool. Liverpool, I think, haven't got Virgil van Dijk back. Uh, but, but in answer to your question, it'll depend on the clubs. Mm. And I think they take, they're, they're, they're masters, really, of, and we shouldn't underestimate that, uh, uh, analysing their own uh, players' fitness and where they're at in terms of their nutrition, etc., etc. And they are human beings when all said and done, and you've got to have a, let them have a little bit of downtime because when they come back, there ain't going to be many days off. Yes, the other thing I suppose here is the mental intensity of the World Cup, which uh, every team and every player at the World Cup, whether they were the favourites or not, uh, would have experienced. And uh, again, it's this human factor that kicks in. You can hardly expect players, you know, particularly the high-profile players like the Bales and the Bellinghams of this world, to continue with that high level of intensity sub 
suddenly back in club football. So it'll be interesting to see how these stars, as it were, from the World Cup handle this transition back into football over the next month or so. Yeah, indeed. Um, and you know what it's like. You go back from your holidays. You've been there two days back at work and you think, oh, hang on a minute. That holiday seemed a long time ago. Um, and there, is, there will have been an intensity with the World Cup. And uh, also, because of the, 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 the amount of training that they do and so on, it, you know, it's got, you've got to manage their workloads. So uh, I do think that, you know, we, we can talk again in a month's time and you'll think, wow, yeah, they've played yeah, a lot of games yeah. and the World Cup seems ages ago. So uh, it is just um, a question, really, of, 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 of staggering their returns and making sure that everybody's uh, ready uh, for, for not, not just for for Thursday's game, City and Liverpool, but also so that they can look further afield and, and further much further mm. ahead. And also, I guess this uh, will have a bearing on what happens to, in the Premiership race at the moment. OK, Arsenal in a very good position going into Christmas with a five-point lead. It was only about a, what a, just over a third of the season gone. And so how the remaining two-thirds plays out will also, I imagine, be affected a bit by um, the hangover effect from the World Cup, won't it? Or do you think if Arsenal can hang on to this five-point lead through this busy period uh, into the new year, um, they could maybe hang on for the title? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, Gabriel Jesus is out with a long-term injury, picked up in the World Cup. Um, It is going to be a test of Arsenal's resolve, but um, let's not forget Manchester City lost at home to Brentford in the last game that they played in the Premier League. So uh, they've got something to to prove when they come back. Um, and I, I, yeah, I just think there's so much football to be played, mm. really, mm. that um, it, it, it's impossible to predict. Uh, I, I also think that it's you're, you're spinning a lot of plates, really, because I mean Manchester City playing Liverpool and they've got this phenomenal record in the Carabao Cup, the League Cup won it four times in the last few years, lost last season. Uh, and a lot of City fans say, well, let's get, you know, win the Carabao Cup. It's the first trophy you can win at the end of February uh, and get it in the bank as a major trophy, albeit the least popular trophy that there is to win out there. So uh, I, I think you've just got to uh, think about your priorities, I suppose. They can put the Champions League to bed till February, but that will be City's... Uh, main priority. I mean, for Liverpool, obviously they're off the pace in the Premier League. So, what do they? How do they view their season? Do they think, well, let's concentrate on the Champions League? Um, I think City and Liverpool will concentrate on the Champions League. Arsenal haven't got that problem to consider, although they have got the Europa League, as have Manchester United. So, they've got a, quite a busy schedule coming up in terms of their Thursday night commitments in those competitions. So, uh, uh, there is so much football to be played really and I just think it was such a an early stage of uh, the season even though in terms of the calendar I always think that as soon as you get to Christmas and the new year then the end of the season just races it's unbelievable not just in football but just thinking life once you get to first of January it may's here before you know it um, and <laughs> yeah. uh, it, you know it just races by <laughs> You're getting old, Andy. You're getting old when you think <laughs> when you think like that. Yes, it'll be interesting to see what sort of physical condition some of these guys are in. Uh, you know, come April, May, at, at, towards the end of the season. But anyway, we'll wait and see. You have a very happy Christmas and enjoyable Christmas. Hope it's not too cold for you. I've got a son who's flying uh, from Barcelona into L- London tomorrow. He's never been to London before, and he's very keen. He's a good, ca- uh, keen Chelsea fan, so he's going down to Stamford Bridge, I think, uh, on the 28th to see Chelsea play someone. Um, and he's buying all these warm clothes because of the uh, cold weather, which is it still a cold snap hitting Britain? Yeah, well, there was a cold snap last week. It was ridiculous temperatures, minus 10, and uh, uh, but it has got a lot milder, so much so that it was like 14 degrees uh, yesterday, ah, okay. which is quite tropical, really, where I live in South Manchester. That is typically tropical, uh, but it, it, it's uh, but because of the nature of where we live and the, the uh, the west of England, the Manchester, Liverpool, we get all the uh, Atlantic lows, so all the rain that swept in off the Atlantic lands on our <laughs> on our heads, uh, and uh, we, which is why Manchester, you know, the, the, the long-standing joke about it always rains in Manchester, which is pretty true actually. Uh, that um, you know, we, we it's it's mild, but it's it's wet. Mm. Uh, so we're back to the back to the wet, back to the mild, oh, back to the familiar yeah. weather. The old London. But but well, talking about my age as well, I always look forward to tomorrow because. 
uh, is the shortest day of the year in England. So it will go. It goes dark now at um, quarter to four in the afternoon. Wow! It doesn't go yeah. light until nearly nine a.m. Um, and then tomorrow, you know, two minutes every day of extra daylight in the evening for us. So I know it's a it's a, probably a, a hard thing for. Uh, people from New Zealand. Too. Well, we're um, the reverse. Yes, t- tomorrow was the longest yeah. day. I mean, I uh, I was out mowing lawns last night at quarter to night, and then I came at quarter to nine, and I came in and read the paper without even having to put the lights on at nine o'clock. So, um, yeah. Yeah. and um, further south you go, down the bottom of the South Island, you, they get another hour's light, so it's still light at ten o'clock yeah. at the moment. But um, anyway, Andy, um, you stay well and uh, enjoy your Christmas, and thanks for your reports over Happy the last Christmas. couple of weeks. Thank you. Thank you.